even when we look way back when, when we were first told, you know, you need to limit fat, the evidence for that recommendation was not there. And since then, there's been more and more studies that have come out that have exonerated fat. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'll tell you that we are publishing our one-year cardiovascular outcomes. So one of the big questions is, can you reverse type 2 diabetes while improving other cardiovascular risk markers? Because the thing people are concerned about is, oh, sure, my diabetes get be gets better, but I'm going to die because my cholesterol has gone through the roof. Yeah. And that's not what we see. Hey, my friend, welcome back to another show. It's Mike Mutzel here with HighIntensityHealth.com. As always, I'm so grateful that you're here. I'm excited. Uh, the show notes, the links and so forth to Verta Health and where you can connect with Dr. Sarah Harburg is right below. And most importantly, the research that we're going to talk about and review in this episode, the links to those papers are below as well. And I think it's really, really important that you know that so that you can share that with your, your family doctor, your friend's doctor, um, anyone that's not really totally you know sold that lifestyle change and these novel therapies that we talk about on this channel, like low-carb, high-fat, nutrition, exercise, and so forth, how those compare to what we know to be called usual care. So that's kind of the standard of care or quote unquote evidence-based medicine. As you know right now, you know, the ketogenic diet, low carb, high fat nutrition, and all that does not really fit into the evidence-based model, but Dr. Tara Hallberg, Jeff Volick, Steve Finney, they're pushing the needle forward and doing non-randomized but open label controlled trials to figure out how this novel ketogenic diet therapy that a lot of you embark on anyway, how that is very effective for weight loss, for improving cardiovascular health, for affecting blood sugar health and blood sugar regulation. So uh, again, please share this with your family doctor, uh, anyone that's, that's not totally sold that there's evidence here to show that you know increasing your fat intake and reducing your carb intake can actually improve your cardiovascular health and improve your blood sugar regulation. Key stuff, friends, because that's how we're going to move the pendulum forward and really make sweeping changes within the healthcare system and the health of, of uh, our neighbors, friends, and loved ones at large. And so uh, another company that's synergistic with this movement is Health IQ. They're the progressive life insurance company, the sponsor of this episode and many other past episodes on the High Intensity Health channel because they get it, friends. They understand that people like you and I who exercise when we get a good night's sleep without you know having our phones blaring in our face, when we eat a low-carb, high-fat diet and embark on all these other, other lifestyle changes that we talk about, guess what? We have better blood sugar regulation, reduce inflammatory signaling in our body. Uh, our chances of becoming overweight are diminished and therefore our chances of you know having sudden cardiac death or, or uh, premature you know mortality from other causes is reduced. Health IQ gets it and they will want to reward people like you and I by helping us save money on our life insurance premiums. I would encourage you if you have loved ones, people that depend upon you for an income, that you at least get a free quote to see if you can save a little bit on your life insurance premiums. You can do so by going to healthiq.com forward slash H-I-H. Again, that, that URL to get a free quote to see if you qualify, again, is healthiq.com forward slash H-I-H. All right, that's it for me. Let's dive into it with Dr. Sarah Hallberg. Dr. Sarah Hallberg, really appreciate you coming on. Absolutely, thanks so much thanks. for having me. Yeah. So I think we first got connected on Twitter like uh, three or four years ago. Right. And so I've been wanting to reach out to you after seeing your TED talk at Purdue here. Yeah. Um, so maybe let's just back up a little bit. Uh, you've been a big voice in the low carb, you know, I should say for diabetes, getting mm -hmm. people to re reduce their carbohydrates. And you have a very eloquent way of the reason why that is. If you talk about how diabetes is really a, a glucose intolerance type disorder. Um, so it makes a lot of sense, right? To minimize the carbohydrates, but where did you first kind of get this itch or this idea that like the guidelines, um, are, uh, you know, weren't getting the clinical results maybe for the patients you're working with? Well, that's a great question. And it actually goes back a long ways because I used to be what I would say is Dean Ornish's number one fan. So I was preaching what I was taught, you know, low fat, mostly plant-based um, diet. And I was in primary care for close to a decade before I made a switch into dealing with diabetes and obesity medicine. And what I kept seeing was patients continuing to get worse. I mean, I would come home every night, lay my head down, and tell my husband that I was just 
perpetuating the problem. I was like a legal drug dealer and nobody seemed to be getting better. And, you know, how do we carry on this way? And I was really fortunate because IU uh, knew my background actually was in exercise physiology. So they said, would you be interested in opening an obesity program here? And I jumped in and then spent a year in the literature. Like, what is going to work, right? Because what I was tasked with was the unsolvable problem. What do we do about obesity? Mm -hmm. So what I found really shocked me was, wait a minute, there's not any evidence to be using what we've all been using to deal with this disease. Yeah. And so when the clinic opened at Indiana University Health, it was a low carbohydrate clinic. And what we quickly saw was that, okay, yes, people were losing weight, but more importantly, their diabetes was going away. Mm -hmm. And wait a minute, I never learned that. I didn't learn this could, you know, be something that people could solve for themselves, that they could actually get rid of this huge epidemic plaguing the country, but that's what was happening. So we jumped in to say, where is this in the guidelines? Who's doing this? And with a handful of notable exceptions, no one. And I got mad. Yeah. <laughs> and so really did a big pivot and jumped into research. Was really fortunate enough to team up with Dr. Steve Finney, mm. Dr. Jeff Volick, and Sami Ikenen at um, Verta Health. And we launched what is the largest and longest trial looking at nutritional ketosis as a treatment to reverse type 2 diabetes. That's amazing. Yeah. Good for you guys. Now, how did you get connected with them? Was that your own research looking at some of the stuff that they were doing at Ohio State and, and Finney's work, or did they reach out to you because of the TED Talk? Like, how did that happen? Well, I met Steve two days before my TED Talk mm. at a conference. So um, that was a big week yeah, <laughs> for me say. in my life. <laughs> yeah. uh, definitely a, a pivot turn week. Mm -hmm. So I just ran into him at a conference and I said, hey, you gotta hear what we're doing in Indiana, right? Mm -hmm. Who knew, Indiana? But this wonderful stuff is occurring at our clinic and we just did a small pilot and I'm looking for funding for a larger trial. We went out to dinner that night and within a year we had a fully enrolled, almost 500 patient, single site trial. IRB approved, going. Wow. And you know, most people would say that's impossible, but boy oh boy, I mean we didn't sleep for mm -hmm. that year, but we did it. And that's it. It was a conference run-in. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. So going, this was um, when you took that year to do all the research and stuff. And you were, what is it, family practice or internal medicine? Internal medicine is okay. my background. Mm -hmm. And then you did the fellowship in obesity medicine as well. So or? yes, I'm board certified now in obesity medicine and actually also clinical lipidology mm -hmm. because it really all goes together. Yeah. And again, my background is as an exercise physiologist as well. Just for context for people, like as an obesity medicine specialist, you know, the, the guidelines for treatment and all that, is it more like some of the appetite suppressant medications? I mean, is, is exercise and low carbon keto, is that even talked about for practitioners in that space? It is mm. actually. And so I am a member of the Obesity Medicine Association and mm. they put out a little, you know, kind of flip chart for doctors, you know, quick book about what to do for obesity treatment. And low carb is definitely, um, you know, a noted uh, treatment path. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there's always still discussion about medications and, and, and they can be helpful for some people. Right. But once again, once we can really change the content of the diet without having to calorie restrict, mm -hmm. we can be successful in most people without having to turn to medications. In fact, of course, and the goal is to be turning to less overall for health. Mm -hmm. So back when you would go home at night, you know, before this transition and so forth, this epiphany, this aha moment, um, what medicines were you using for diabetes? Are we talking about metformin or insulin? Like when you said you would feel guilty about like using drugs, um, just for context for people, like what meds were those? Um, those were everything for yeah. diabetes. So absolutely, you know, early cases, we were utilizing metformin primarily. But again, what we were seeing is people continuing to get worse. So metformin alone may work for some people for a little while, but pretty soon it's another oral agent and another and another, and then insulin. And the thing is, when I was in medical school, um, we learned about something called U500 insulin, which is the heavily 
concentrated insulin. Mm -hmm. We learned about it, but you never really saw it used. And what we were seeing is then all the time, people coming in on this incredibly high dose, high concentrated insulin. Because again, things were just getting worse and worse and worse, and people's need for exogenous insulin was so high. Hmm. And essentially what we were doing, right, the national guideline, if you will, is treat food with medicine. Ultimately, that's what we were doing, right? People were eating wrong, we were giving them the wrong advice, and in order to deal with that, we were just giving them more drugs. It's a crazy system. Yeah. And we as a nation need to back out of that because only when we do that will we allow people to reverse their type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. I mean, the reason why I brought that question up is because um, those medicines will drop their blood sugar. And doesn't that cause, not that medicines are bad, right, in all cases, but is it kind of a vicious cycle? Because if you're not making the concomitant dietary change, the meds will, will drop your blood sugar, you get a spike, and it creates more of this vicious cycle of more hungry and overeating. So it's, the course correction doesn't really happen. Is that kind of what you were seeing? Absolutely. And in fact, what happens is that we get into this vicious cycle, and with every additional medication that we add, we actually just speed up the cycle, right? Speed it up because we're never actually dealing with the problem. You know, we're trying to band-aid it. And I mean, even the Band-Aid doesn't hold up, right? Yeah. But it certainly doesn't hold up for very long. And again, people get more and more frustrated. I mean, it's painful. Mm -hmm. You know, when I see people come into the clinic or talk to them through the app uh, with Verta Health, what we see is people were frustrated. You know, they, they come in and they're just so relieved to hear you're doing better for once, right? Because what they're used to is going in to see a physician and the first thing that physician does is whip out a prescription pad and say, I'm sorry, things are not looking so good. You need to go on a medication. So I mean, if we really think about this vicious cycle, mm -hmm. diabetes is a problem of elevated blood sugar. Carbohydrates are what cause our blood sugar to go up, even those complex carbohydrates, right? People say, well, as long as you're eating the, you know, complex carbohydrates, you're okay. Yeah. No, actually you're not, okay? Whole grains make your blood sugar go up. It's just a fact. Mm -hmm. And so if we want to deal with a disease whose problem, I mean, the cause, the, the issue with type 2 diabetes is blood sugar elevation caused by carbohydrates, we have to eliminate the carbohydrates. And that vicious cycle not only slows down initially, then halts, and then starts to go backwards. And that's what we want to see, people backing out of the vicious cycle. Interesting. Now there's concerns about hypoglycemia and stuff like that when people start reducing their carbohydrates. So how do you address that as a clinician? That is a fantastic and incredibly important question mm -hmm. because it's important for people not to be doing this on their own who have type 2 diabetes and are on medications. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the beauties of Verta Health and how we're functioning because each participant who starts in Verta Health gets their own physician. Um, and that physician is there to make sure that those medications get decreased safely. And so, for example, in our large trial, we didn't have any major hypoglycemic events at all, which is really unheard of when you get patients who are on insulin. But that's because we were able to see their blood sugars in almost real time mm. and make, again, those almost real time adjustments to ensure that people were able to get their blood sugars under control and get off medications safely. Like it. Were they wearing uh, continuous glucose monitors or testing at home or how were they doing that? Testing at home for uh -huh. the trial because the continuous glucose monitors, I'm glad you asked that question, are going to change the game. Yeah. So I actually have mine on right now nice. because I'm trying to see it from a patient perspective. Yeah. So the Libre from Abbott is going to be a game changer because finally the continuous glucose monitors are going to be available to the type 2 community mm -hmm. because this is affordable, so easy to use. 
um, and is going to help us even more because we can see, of course, what blood sugars are doing in between those finger sticks. Totally. But actually also eliminating the finger sticks. Yeah. It's just a quick swipe and we're done. Easy. Mm -hmm. I know I, I got it last year. It was kind of a pain to get it off eBay and it was in uh, French and all that sort of stuff, but it was really cool to see, and this is kind of my next question parlays into that, all the, the non-dietary factors that affected blood sugar, like sleep issues. I was traveling through an airport and security mm -hmm. was really long. I was going to miss my flight yep. and my blood sugar went up. Normally it would hover around like 82. I've been keto and low carb for a while. It went up almost to over 200 and I was like, what? And then it dropped right back down. But have you found with the health coaching and, and the Verta model with the app and the health coaches and the doctors and, and like real time access, that there's major um, non-dietary factors that tend to move the needle? And 100%, so, mm -hmm. 100%. And it's something we can't overlook, right? Because, you know, I, just this morning, and I was explaining this to a patient. Yeah. We got the emotional health, right? And we've got the physical health. And a lot of times we try to treat these as separate issues when they're really intertwined, mm -hmm. right? And the emotional health can be tied to things like you just said. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean necessarily that there's some big trauma going on. It can be, I had a bad night's sleep. Mm -hmm. I'm traveling. Um, I'm working third shift for some of our patients. So it's really important that we're able to help people with all kinds of things. Yeah. And not just, okay, the food, we have to get that. There's no question about it. But these factors that we sometimes dismiss are critical to control as well. Mm. And is that where the health coach comes in to really help with that and kind of pinpoint? Because they get to know people over time. Exactly. Yeah. It's really, it's not only are they able to provide feedback, right? Mm -hmm. They're able to provide personalized feedback. So, you know, they may know, you know, the father-in-law just died. Oh my goodness, you've been sitting in the hospital for two weeks with them, right? Okay, what kind of things can we do in that situation to ensure that you're taking care of yourself, yeah. right? And so it's just really important to be able to give not only feedback and support, but also to make it individualized and personalized to not only that person and maybe their work situation, their cultural background, but what's happening that week in their life. Mm -hmm. So knowing this now, seeing what do we call this model? Is it telemedicine or app-based medicine? The no, I would say it's remote care remote. or telemedicine. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you've been a practitioner, uh, an MD for how many years now? 15? So I graduated in 2002. Okay. I'm yeah. aging myself and I was an yeah. old med student, so <laughs> I'm really aging myself, but that's right. okay. No, I've seen a lot during that time. Yeah, mm -hmm. wisdom, right? Um, so knowing what you know now, um, remote-based care, telemedicine, et cetera, could you ever see yourself like, like, is the model changing? Like, could you ever go back to just like, as you told that, or uh, the words that you use in vernacular, brick and mortar medicine, like what the one-on-one -on -one patient, I mean, do you think that, that that model is giving patients the best quality of care? Um, I think that we are giving better care remotely yeah. because we're really able to personalize it. And the problem with brick and mortar, and it, it's not that that can't be accomplished, and, mm. and I don't think it's going away tomorrow by any stretch, right. but we're more and more going to be turning over to telemedicine. Um, and the personalization of it is the key because you need to bring the medicine to the patient instead of right now we want the patient to come to us. Mm -hmm. But just to set up an appointment, and I was joking with you earlier mm -hmm. about this, but like let's just say you have to call for a dentist appointment, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, how long does call for the dentist stay on your to-do list? Because that's a barrier right there. You gotta take the time to do it, and in the chaos of all of our lives now, that's a project, mm -hmm. right? So you have to call to make the appointment, and then you have to take time off of work maybe to get to the appointment. You know, there's just a lot of barriers. Whereas with telemedicine, you can really set up things to be on your own schedule. At Verta, we like to say, it's like having a physician and a health coach in your pocket, because it truly is. And that way, we can meet you where you are. And it seems like that, knowing that it's in your pocket, knowing that there's more like, it's like an accountability partner, right? So if you only go to the doctor every, at best 90 days, right? Whatever. Um, you know you can kind of clean up your diet and lifestyle like 10 days before you go so your numbers look really good. So I'm sure you saw some of that. And now, with especially now if people are getting onto continuous glucose monitors, the health coach can go, hey, what's going on with this? So I, I love that model. I think it's really, 
Yeah. You're absolutely right, though. That's exactly what people do, and they admit it freely in the clinic. Mm -hmm. Well, I knew I had, you know, or they'll say, I didn't show up last month because I knew I was doing really bad and I needed to give myself another, you know, month to get back on track. And then right. in reality, it only happened two weeks before mm -hmm. they came. But you're right. See, the health coach can say, hey, you know what? I saw that you're gaining weight. What's going on? Or the blood sugars are up a little bit. Let's go mm -hmm. back and reevaluate ketones dropping. There's so many ways that we can, again, personalize and help on the spot. Yeah, that's awesome. Can anyone enroll in, at Verta Health? I mean, if, or is it only research-based at this point in time? No, no. Okay. Um, you know, we've got our large clinical trial that's ongoing, but mm -hmm. Verta Health is now available in all 50 states. Um, we do have direct-to-consumer, but most of our um, participants right now are coming through our contracts with large um, companies that are self-insured. I see. Mm -hmm. So that they can save money. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. So like right here in Indiana, for example, you know, Purdue University, um, we have a contract with Purdue. So any Purdue employee on their insurance with type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes is able to enroll in the Verta program. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So it's really scaling up personalized it's medicine. really scaling up. You know, um, because a lot, I mean, and it needs to happen, right? I mean, the numbers are pretty staggering with the, the adults that have either obesity or prediabetes and the normal weight individuals that are insulin resistant, that often doesn't get talked about. You know, um, did you see that a lot in the clinic? Like people look visibly healthy, but metabolically they're kind of a train wreck. Yeah, we call them metabolically obese. Mm -hmm. um, and so even if they're normal weight on the scale, they can still suffer from type two diabetes, fatty liver disease is really common, yeah. um, and lots of cholesterol issues. So that is, happens a lot more often than people think. And you're right, the numbers are staggering on this. Over 50% of the adults in this country have diabetes or prediabetes. I mean, how did we get here? Mm -hmm. And that doesn't include all the insulin resistant people. Right. So what we can say is most people have some sort of a metabolic issue in this country and Scary. across the world. Yeah, seeing the numbers um, in Asia, like in India, it's, it's really staggering. I remember seeing some research there. Yeah, I myself, you know, when the whole gluten-free movement kind of came on, uh, I had this mindset that if it was gluten-free, it was like acceptable, right? And my, I would always have these blood sugar crashes until I went keto. And, but I'm, you know, physically active, I've been lifting weights for a while, so I, you know, the number, I think we're all susceptible to this. And that's why I love, uh, irrespective of people's, you know, viewpoints long-term on keto, being uh, low-carb, high-fat, at least majority of the time, has a lot of benefit. Um, you mentioned measuring ketones in, in, within the app. Is there a preferred time of day that you like people to look at their ketones and kind of getting into the tactics for people? Um, you know, I think, again, this is another personalized thing, but I'll tell you, on average, people's ketones tend to be a little bit lower in the morning. That's not a problem for us, I mean, because we're looking for consistency. Yeah. Um, but sometimes people like to check them right before dinner instead, mm -hmm. because they do tend to be up a little bit higher then. But as far as like what we can act on, you know, uh, we say do what's going to be easiest for you. Yeah. There's this new uh, a startup actually called Level in Seattle. Have you heard of them? I don't know. I haven't. It's a, it's a, they have this little micro sensor that, has, that um, looks at breath acetone. Oh, okay. And so it's really cool. So real time and it syncs with the app. So that could be a technology you guys maybe or other people could look at. I just got it set up on Saturday. And it was really fun. I brought it to a, a dinner party with low carb friends on Sunday. We're uh -huh. kind of playing around with it, but it's really accurate. Um, yeah, and so you can, you have like this um, low acetone tester and then a high acetone so you can calibrate it like in real time to see if you have a weird number. To yeah, see. yeah. Um, so I, I found that to be really interesting. Well, I think it's, it's a perfect example of how we're all accommodating to this lifestyle in this country, right? right? People are realizing that they need to be able to make products and have things available for people who are choosing to do this because you know, people are sick and tired of being sick and tired. Yeah. And, you know, they're making changes. They're, you know, realizing that their health can be restored and companies are coming to support that. So, and so I think it's not even going to be long before we see a continuous mm -hmm. ketone monitor. That would be cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You think we'll get to the point where we can test insulin and blood more readily? I mean... I think we and, will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that um, I think that more sophisticated ketone testing, as you kind of talked to, is the next step that mm -hmm. we're going to see. 
um, but we'll, I think, have implantables to be able to read levels for all kinds of things in the not too distant future. Yeah. Making it more and more just accessible and easier for people. Mm -hmm. Right. Instead of the old finger stick and the alcohol tap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think Which is again a barrier. It. Yeah. Right. Another barrier we right. put in for people. We're back. Yes. Different room. That's right. right. We had to move room, guys. So uh, thanks for tuning back in. Okay. So let's talk about fat. You know, okay. a major is we're talking about like a mental hurdle people have. When they hear about ketos, it's high fat, and they've heard for many years that fat is linked with heart disease. So let's talk about the actual evidence. So really, the evidence is lacking. You know, that's that's the big picture, high level uh, discussion about it. Is even when we look way back when, when we were first told, you know, you need to limit fat, the evidence for that recommendation was not there. And since then, there's been more and more studies that have come out that have exonerated fat. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'll tell you that we are publishing our one-year cardiovascular outcomes. So one of the big questions is, can you reverse type 2 diabetes while improving other cardiovascular risk markers? Because the thing people are concerned about is, oh, sure, my diabetes get be gets better, but I'm going to die because my cholesterol has gone <laughs> through the roof. Yeah. And that's not what we see. So what our study showed us is yes, people can reverse their type 2 diabetes, but they can also significantly improve other cardiovascular risk factors, such as significant decreases in blood pressure while blood pressure medication is reduced, significant increase in good cholesterol or HDL, significant decrease in triglycerides. Now, we did see a increase in LDL cholesterol. However, for patients with insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes, mm -hmm. a much better cardiovascular risk marker is what we call LDLP, or the number of LDL particles, or ApoB particles. Mm -hmm. And what we saw in that at a year is that it didn't change. Mm. So all these risk factors significantly improved and the one that everyone is worried about didn't change. So we made so many positive changes. Another really notable risk factor that got better mm -hmm. is inflammation. So markers of inflammation, specifically one called C-reactive protein, decreased by 40% wow. over the year. I mean, that is remarkable. And these are things right now that there aren't good medicines for. Inflammation or C-reactive protein can be lowered st some with statins, mm -hmm. but as far as dealing with the triglycerides and the HDL, uh, HDL levels, there's no medicine for that. But people can do it themselves by just changing the content of their diet. That's amazing. So was there any exercise implementation in, in, that, um, in that particular study? Was it just dietary change? Really just dietary change. Wow. So, you know, our goal is always to get people moving and mm -hmm. exercising, but we absolutely don't push them to do that initially because, you know, when fe people are feeling crummy, the last thing in the world they want to hear is someone saying, well, you just have to get out and exercise, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we've been hearing that forever and it's failed us. So exercise is really important. But when I want someone exercising is when they come to me and say, I'm feeling so much better. I've lost weight, I have more energy, and I'm ready to start exercising. Boom, yeah. let's do it. Now's the time. And that's when it's gonna stick with them as mm. well. Right. Yeah, because there's still that inflammation, you know, because osteoarthritis and joint pain from leptin and all this, these other things. So if I heard you correctly, like a, a kind of stepwise approach, cutting out the carbohydrates, increasing the good fats and so forth, um, losing a little bit of weight, get a little bit more energy, then start hitting the gym a little bit more. You because it. it's your, your own intrinsic motivation driving you, not some external person kind of telling you. Exactly, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, exercise, it's difficult for people to stick with mm -hmm. because they're just being told to do it and that they're going to get some miraculous results out of exercising alone. Yeah. And, you know, exercise is key to health overall, but it needs to be implemented with dietary changes mm -hmm. and overall lifestyle changes, some of those stress factors that we were talking about before to make it effective in the long run and for people to really stick with it in the long run. Mm -hmm. And you know, one other thing you just said, if you don't mind, oh, if yeah. I comment on, sure. you said um, an increase the good fats. Yeah. And that's another question, speaking of fats that we get, people always ask, what is a good fat? Mm -hmm. You know, 
thinking that I'm going to say only olive oil. And olive oil is a good fat, but there are other good fats as well. So the saturated fats are something that people, again, have long thought were bad for them. Yeah. But good whole food sources of saturated fat. And that's the key word here. A good fat is a whole food source of fat. So that means from meats. That can mean from coconut oil. Um, that can mean from dairy, like butter or heavy cream. Along with, you know, we always encourage olive oil consumption. But the things that we tell people to stay away from are those highly processed vegetable and soy oils. Mm -hmm. That is not a good fat. It's a great point. Uh, I was at Whole Foods last night in Chicago and there was these vegetarian burgers and like the second ingredient was canola oil, right? right. So a lot of people are like, oh, it's plant-based, it must be healthy. And they're not hearing the, you know, the processed seed oils as being problematic. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. Um, where do you stand on, on like um, bacon and, and, you know, cause a lot of people hear keto, they think bacon and butter is basically mm -hmm. all they're having. But I heard right. you mentioned avocado, olives, olive mm -hmm. oil, like coconut, all those healthy plant-based fats. Do you like to kind of add a variety in there? I mean, I do. I mean, yeah. and then that's part of the whole personalization importance too. You know, like right here in Indiana, um, you know, it's super easy for people living here to get really good whole food bacon, mm -hmm. right? Because we can get it from the farmers, yeah. right? And, you know, we know what the pigs are fed and, you know, it's not uh, processed with a lot of sugar or nitrites. So, mm -hmm. you know, it depends. Here, it's easy to do, right? Yeah. Other places, they may have more of a struggle and they may rely more on fats from other sources. So it really depends on you know, where the person is, what they enjoy eating, mm -hmm. and you know what their lifestyle is. I love that approach, but what I heard there is tacitly implied is eat local, like when possible, right? And so that's the other thing too, where a lot of people are going keto and they're buying like refined palm oil MCT powder and that's their main fat, you know? And so it's, they're, you know, that's coming from Malaysia or wherever. So that's a great point. Like eat local, like if great healthy pigs are being raised here and that's local to you, like make that a, a good staple. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great and point. you know, people always say, well, that's going to cost a lot more. And mm -hmm. I would say actually beg to differ, right? Yeah. A, a lot of also the cuts of meat that they're going to be choosing to, even when they're good locally sourced meats are still going to be cheaper mm -hmm. because what we're looking for is the fattier cuts of meat, yeah. the things that are generally speaking much lower in cost. Mm -hmm. And you're right. I mean, I think central to any low carb, high fat diet, is a whole food diet. And we really almost should always lead off on that. Yeah. We talk about low carb, high fat, but even before it, it should be whole food, low carb, high fat. Yeah, I love that approach. Yeah, that's where I have this conversation to help people better understand that. I think it's really, really mm -hmm. important. Um, going back to heart disease, so there's the DASH diet, which is sodium reduced and all that sort of stuff. And uh, one of the things that I've learned from Dr. Finney, having lunch with him and stuff like that at a seminar in Seattle, is low carb people, definitely low carb keto, people that are eating a low carb ketogenic style diet need more sodium, around four grams per day. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on salt? I am completely concurring with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, again, salt is one of these other mistakes that we've made. You know, oops, data wasn't there, right? We got this idea that everybody needs to eat low salt. And there have been some really brilliantly done studies that refute that. And notice I said studies, like it's not just one. And so what we see is that salt consumption, there's a J curve, okay? Meaning like you see problems at the very low end, problems at the extreme end, and we're talking really extreme, not, not something that people are consuming on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And that really best zone seems to be three to five grams of sodium a day, much higher range than people are being told to consume now. But that's where people did the best. So yeah, enjoy your salt. Mm -hmm. It, and along with fat, makes food taste better. <laughs> <laughs> totally does, yeah. Salt, sugar, fat, those mm -hmm. are kind of the three that we look at. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. So telling that to someone that has hypertension, they might be a little bit skeptical at first. So, so how do you kind of work, navigate around that? So, you know, again, what we saw in our study is that not only did blood pressure go down, mm -hmm. but it went down while we were decreasing blood pressure medications. And these people were all being instructed to consume extra salt. Yeah. 
So that's one of the other reasons that I would say it's so important to be working with a physician to ensure your blood pressure is well controlled. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't enjoy the salt. Yeah. In fact, again, as part of this, you're likely to have better blood pressure control with less medicine. Mm -hmm. So remember, a little tip here, take this, like make sure you're cutting your carbohydrates while you're increasing the salt. That would be kind of like a take home. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, great yep. tip. So I have a, uh, we talked about continuous glucose monitor. I have a blood pressure cuff at home I use periodically. Do you recommend just prophylactically people are, are becoming more aware of their blood pressure numbers? Well, I think it's really good for people to just understand themselves better and like mm -hmm. how their body reacts to different things. So for anyone with a history of high blood pressure, we do have them check blood pressures at home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. And is that part of the, the app? Like one of the, yep. one of the tools that you use? It's so one of the biomarkers that we use for patients with a history of high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, going back to those biomarkers that help us help patients track where they have been and where they're going, but also be able to make those day to day variations and recommendations mm -hmm. is that biomarkers would be blood pressure, would be weight would be blood sugar and also serum ketones. Mm -hmm. Nice. Mm -hmm. And what are the numbers for serum ketones where you like them to be? Is there a sweet spot for like optimal fat burning and that? That's, a, that's another great question. Um, and we're, we're still learning about mm -hmm. this. So right now what we're setting is our goals for our patients to be above 0.5 millimole okay, of beta hydroxybutyrate, which is the ketone body we use when we check, you know, prick your finger and mm -hmm. check. But we also think that there may be a role in, you know, ketosis even at lower levels. Hmm. And we're learning some things about this from a really unexpected source. And so that source is actually diabetes medications. Hmm. So one of the things with diabetes medications is, you know, yes, they lowered people's blood sugar acutely, but when we looked at outcomes, people did not do better. Right? So they got this acute lowering of blood sugar, but it didn't help in their cardiovascular outcomes. They died just as much if they were taking it versus if they weren't taking it. Mm -hmm. Until a class of medications came out called SGLT2 inhibitors. And this was very exciting in the world of diabetes and cardiovascular disease because for the first time, we actually saw some cardiovascular mortality improvements. Mm -hmm. And so people started looking into why, why was this happening? Why did things get better? And two different research groups, actually in two different countries, came up with the same conclusion. And it was the fact that these, this class of medications actually elevated ketones. Interesting. And they elevated ketones to a lower level, more in the range of 0 0.3, yet people were seeing these significant cardiovascular improvements. Hmm. So. You know, again, it leads us to think that maybe it, certain people can get benefits from even a little bit lower levels of ketones. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things about personalizations, but I'll end this on SGLT2 inhibitors and a low carb, high fat diet, mm -hmm. not necessarily a good mix because okay. the SGLT2 inhibitors by themselves with a normal diet really increase the risk for diabetic ketoacidosis. Hmm. By, by virtue of increasing ketones. Mm -hmm. and, yes, and, and they can go too high. Whereas with someone who's making insulin still intrinsically, yeah. a low carb, high fat diet is incredibly, almost never gonna cause diabetic ketoacidosis. Right, right, because glucose is always often low. Right, right? There's exactly. not that parallel increase. The SGLT2 inhibitors, what's the mechanism? Are those in cretin mimetics in that? or No, actually what they do is they block the SGLT2 path in the kidney. So it's at the level of the kidney and they don't allow reabsorption of glucose. I so see. we filter glucose through our kidneys all day long, mm -hmm. but we take most of it back in and don't excrete it, right? Unless, of course, we know patients with diabetes who have had very elevated um, levels of blood sugar know that they do lose some in their urine. Mm -hmm. But this blocks it from being reabsorbed. And so essentially they wind up peeing out right. their glucose and it does help with blood sugar control, but again, also can increase that potential risk there that we don't see hmm. with the ketogenic diet regularly. It seems like there might be a link with like bladder cancer and other urinary tract with the higher levels of glucose coming out. 
with that drug, I don't know. Not it that definitely it matters, increases the risk for infections. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, and we see that all the time. That, yeah. That's a significant risk. UTIs and whatnot. Mm -hmm. UTIs and you know yeast infection in women. Yeah. Is, so that's a significant problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why it's great to be natural, right? That's right. That's <laughs> right. The, the less medicine, the ketones. better. Right? Yeah. Uh, with the exception, I do like uh, metformin. I mean, I think the mechanisms are unique and how it affects the microbiome and the gut hormones, and it's relatively the side effect profile is minimal. How do you feel about metformin? Well, I completely agree with that because what we did in our clinical trial is even in patients who had reversed their type 2 diabetes, for the most part, we were encouraging them to stay on metformin mm. because, of course, it has indications outside of type 2 diabetes. Yeah. As you said, it has a very low uh, risk profile. And these people we know had type 2 diabetes. So even if they reversed it, they're genetically predisposed to it. So we do encourage people to stay on it. Yeah, that's amazing. Let's, uh, let's transition a little bit to the policy and what you're doing <clears throat> with policy. And um, maybe, I, should I use the word conspiracy just to maybe set the stage? I, I, I think it's a reasonably appropriate word. Yeah, I mean, it seems <laughs> I really amazing. Do. If you look at the American Diabetic Association website and rec food recommendations for people with diabetes, it's bagels, it's orange juice, it's, uh, it's mind blowing. And so it makes you think like, well, if, if we actually give the, the people that have insulin resistance the right tools, they would get off our meds. So it makes me think there's some collusion here. Can you help us understand well, you know, the, the big concern, again, big overview picture, is that people presume that the American Diabetes Association guidelines are evidence-based, right? That's what they're referred to, the evidence-based American Diabetes Association guideline. And that's not true. I mean, they are really lack of evidence guidelines. And that is really concerning when we're dealing with an epidemic of this degree in this country and around the world. So a great example is that one of the eating patterns that the American Diabetes Association recommends is the DASH diet. The DASH diet is actually recommended as an eating pattern by the American Diabetes Association. They recommend three, and that's the DASH diet, plant-based, and Mediterranean. And the lack of evidence on these three dietary interventions is just incredible when you dive in. But let's focus on the DASH for uh, example. And that is the DASH diet, again recommended to treat an epidemic, was studied in patients with type 2 diabetes once in a study of 31 people that had a short duration, a high dropout rate, and one cultural population. It's incredible. How, how does this get recommended to the American population with this terrible disease when it hasn't been proven effective? In fact, there's evidence that it could make things worse because with the DASH diet, which is relatively high in carbohydrates, what we see is a increase in what we call atherogenic dyslipidemia meaning HDL cholesterol lowers and triglycerides go up, indicating insulin resistance with this dietary intervention is worsening. Hmm. It's crazy. So uh, everything that you talked about in, in your study, so the re reducing triglycerides, increasing HDL, LDL didn't really change much, but the particle size dropped, which is what we're looking for. So that atherogenic dyslipidemia is not occurring, but that's increasing with the DASH diet. Uh, like you just said, which is really astounding. So, you know, prior to the internet, someone in your position saying what you're saying and getting out there, um, it would maybe affect your career trajectory. Um, but I love what you're doing now. And now that so many people do the internet podcast videos, people are aware that like, yeah, this is a little funky, right? This data. So, um, at first, when you first started getting into this, were you like, man, I should maybe not say so much about this or be so boisterous about this because of potential um, career implications, like speaking out on behalf of the, the status quo? Well, number one, I was really mad. Mm -hmm. I was really mad. So some of my passion is just driven by anger because yeah. you know it's heartbreaking to sit with these people, right? And just, you know, one of the things is they cry a lot of times. And they cry not because they're upset with you know this or that or the other thing going on in the clinic or even in their personal life. They're crying over a unbelievable reason. Why didn't anyone tell me this before? That's what people cried about. Hmm. And you know that just drives passion. And I will tell you that when I started off, I did try to consider that. 
So for example, in my own community here in Lafayette, Indiana, what I did is I spent an entire summer with the evidence in a quick 15 minute presentation and I went around to all the medical staff meetings and I explained, hey, when your patients come back and they've been told to eat high fat, here's why. And you know, the reception that I got from that was overwhelmingly positive. Mm -hmm. Just like I had been, right, in the past where I had, you know, preach the low fat, high carbohydrate diet and never thought about it because it was what I was told, that's really what I encountered. That physicians are open to this when they look at the evidence and go, you're right, it doesn't make sense that we're doing this. Mm -hmm. um, and I got a lot of support. And of course, then they've seen their patients come back to them and they're doing so much better. And that speaks for itself. Yeah, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think the internet has something to do with this momentum. Like, it does. Because 30, 40 years ago, it would have been a little bit different, right? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, Nina talks about in, in her book, The Big Fat Surprise, I'm sure you've read, and you're a good friend with her and so mm -hmm. forth, um, how careers just got derailed because people spoke out. Or right. they wouldn't speak out for fear of being ostracized from the community, which is frightening. It is. It's frightening. I mean, how? I mean, this is nutrition is science, yeah. right? And we have to be open to ideas and evidence. Mm -hmm. And what we've really seen in this field is that the status quo has reigned and people are not open. They don't want to hear a debate about that. Real science is debate, yeah. is new evidence, is altering your thinking based on that new evidence. And it is so critical that we push, push, push to get the scientific way of thinking really ingrained in the nutrition space. Yeah, and you're doing a lot of work and I want to finish up with that, but one question that comes up a lot, just in the back of my mind, it's kind of a little sidetrack from what we're saying, uh, APOE4, that allele, so talking about personalizing everything, mm -hmm. um, should those individuals be wary about how much fat they consume for risk of, of either heart disease and or Alzheimer's and things along those lines? We don't have evidence of that. You know, we know that that does increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease and mm. increases cardiovascular risk. But we don't have evidence that this makes it worse. It's an area of interest for sure and something that I hope that we can um, help get a study together uh, to look specifically at that. But right now we don't have any evidence that that means that they should avoid it. And mm -hmm. potentially, and again, I say potentially because we don't have the hard evidence. This is something that could be helpful in that population. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a case report published, I think, at, at folks out in uh, at, in Baltimore, uh, Johns Hopkins. Mm -hmm. It was just an end of one, an individual that, that was overweight, had mild cognitive impairment in his 50s, and went on a ketogenic diet, and there was favorable changes within the lipid profile, improvements in cognitive function and all that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. But it, this question does come up. I'm sure you've heard it yeah. through the app and everything like that. Um, so I wanted to ask you about that. So let's kind of finish up on what you and Nina are working on with the Nutrition Coalition. Right. And policy changing and really kind of helping to get the evidence, the real evidence, not un, you know biased uh, industry influenced evidence out there to help people, you know, help policy change really when it comes to nutrition guidelines. Yeah, I mean, we need to change the dietary guidelines. I mean, we need to ensure that they are truly evidence-based, based on a rigorous scientific process. And people presume that they are, and that's actually not the case. And, and that alone is like something for everybody to need to absorb, right? Mm. So what is the 2015 guidelines? The Nutrition Coalition was formed to ensure that those guidelines could get a proper review. So the Nutrition Coalition, and I have to you know, say hats off to Nina Teicholz for this, was able to get legislation passed that really essentially put those 2015 guidelines through the very first peer review process. So Congress mandated a review by the National Academy of Medicine and actually funded it as well. Well, that report came out just last fall, so September of 2017. And it said what we all already know, that the dietary guidelines are not based on best evidence, that they lack scientific rigor and need to be reformed. The entire process needs to be changed. And so what happened really recently that the Nutrition Coalition was also involved in is that for the very first time, the dietary guidelines are going to be looking at specific 
areas in their review. Instead of trying to review everything, they're gonna do more intensive review on specific topics. And what those topics should be was open uh, for public comment. Mm -hmm. And so the Nutrition Coalition uh, was driving the effort to get people to put a comment in and look to review low carbohydrate diets and saturated fats because we feel that those are definite areas that have not undergone proper review by this panel um, and essentially been ignored and really need to be reviewed for the next iteration of the guideline, which is in 2020. Nice, so it's coming up relatively soon. It is. Yeah, and some of those comments, uh, different areas too, like um, uh, the consumption or the correlation between like dietary fat and, and colon cancer or red meat and cancer, those are like the hot button topics, was, was, those are the things that people, the public was commenting on and that will drive then a review of the literature, is that kind of the process? Exactly. Awesome. Like a true systematic review of the yeah. literature, which is what has been lacking in the past. What I find sometimes um, with systematic reviews or meta-analysis is you really have to look at the inclusion criteria. Oh, yes. Because I have friends that send me stuff like, oh, yeah, see, ketogenic diets like reduce exercise performance. But then you look at the inclusion criteria, and it's, it's kind of interesting. So d for the people that don't understand meta-analysis, um, can you help them better understand like how to decide uh, if there's a, a good one versus a bad one? Or Yeah, you do have to pay really careful attention to the inclusion criteria. Mm -hmm. And then, and this is really shocking, you have to go back to each study that they included to ensure that they actually met the study's own criteria. So what we see happen in some of the review of the literature that I'm doing right now mm -hmm. for diabetes is that a meta-analysis meta -analysis will report its inclusion criteria, yet if you go to the studies that they included, they didn't meet the inclusion criteria. Or there were studies that did and were left out. Mm -hmm. So it, you, you have to be, a very cautious reader okay and it kind of goes back to this idea that evidence-based the experts always know and you know what we can see is that's not always the case people have to be able to independently critique things I'm not saying everybody needs to go dive into all the literature mm -hmm. but you have to listen to what people are saying and take some things a little bit I hate to say it with a grain of, of salt yeah. sometimes and say okay I'm gonna get another opinion about this mm -hmm. right because it's been concerning yeah so don't ignore the anecdotes the end of ones like is that what you're saying because what I see with the and why the I think why keto has gotten so big is because a lot of people are getting such great results and they share it online and other people read that and so forth. Whereas I think in this evidence-based medicine world, we're kind of taught to like ignore the end of ones, ignore the anecdotes. We need the hard data, but as you said, the hard data sometimes um, was particularly. I mean, if you look at the the hierarchy of data, I was taught when I did my master's in nutrition that systematic reviews and meta analysis were like at the top, like. That's what we should be looking at, but there's inherent biases, and then, you know, found, you know, the the structure of how the meta analysis was conducted can be inherently uh, inaccurate. Well, and sometimes. and I do still agree that systematic reviews are the best uh, in the hierarchy of medicine. Sure, you still just have to give them a second look, and we can't ignore anecdotes, right? I mean, yeah. anecdotes are what has put forth a low carb, high fat diet into the mainstream mm -hmm. because we've had so many successful people. But it's more than just anecdotes and that's important too because to really get policy change, you've got to have the evidence. But the fact is when you go into the literature, the evidence is there, but in many cases has been ignored and not reviewed. So I think clinical trials are key. Systematic reviews are still really important, but it's the anecdotes that have led to more and more of these trials that do exist. What our job is, and I say our, meaning the Nutrition Coalition, is to ensure that the science that's there is actually reviewed mm -hmm. because it exists. The papers, the literature, they're there. The peer-reviewed publications exist. We just need to make sure that they're included in reviews. Yeah, brilliant. So I have a few personal questions that I like to ask every guest on the show, but is there anything that we that you're excited about that we didn't yet uh, talk about? Well, I think one of the other things is just where this leads, right? We've talked about cardiovascular risk factors, 
key. Mm -hmm. We've talked about diabetes reversal, incredibly important. We've talked about obesity, right? Improving that makes definitely people feel better and decreases their risk from other things. But it actually goes further than that. And it'll be really interesting. We're gonna be publishing on important, important health topics like what happens with liver? fatty liver disease, right? What happens with joint pain? What happens with sleep? And so what I'm really excited about is how, yes, the big important topics, cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, we see improvements there that have been you know, well documented. But I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. We're gonna see a whole host of other things that have improved as well. Mm -hmm. And would you attribute those improvements to the ketones or to lower or more controlled glucose and lower insulin? Or Because I personally get excited about the ketones because their epigenetic effect and how they mm -hmm. you know, influence inflammatory pathways, mitochondrial function, all that. Um, what it, have you, thought about this and I'm sure you have. Oh yeah, <laughs> thought about it a lot. And yeah. I think it's still an unanswered question, mm -hmm. but my feeling is that we're gonna find out ultimately that it's multifactorial, yeah. right? It's a little bit of everything you just mentioned and probably more that we may not even understand yet. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna be exciting to see what happens in the years to come on this. Cool. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so let's talk about morning routines. So we know successful people, you're a mother of three, mm -hmm. you're an athlete, you're doing all this research as a clinician and so forth. Um, what would be an ideal morning, we can reframe this in, in the sense of preventing obesity or losing body fat and restoring blood sugar levels. What's a great morning routine for not only productivity, um, but to optimize your metabolism? Coffee. <laughs> you do fat like butter and cream in that? Or? No, actually I don't. I am just a black coffee person. Yeah. So a good morning for me is to get up and I like to get up and check email first thing in the morning mm -hmm. with a big cup of coffee. Nice. And so I'm someone who likes to drink coffee beyond just that first cup of the, yeah. of the day. Two so, or three. Mm -hmm. yeah. Getting something off your list first mm -hmm. thing in the morning. And so right now it's what happened to emails overnight, yeah. right? So check through, get through that. You can start off the day with a something off your list. And mm -hmm. I think that is just something that can help drive everybody forward. And so that point in time, it depends on what my day is gonna be, because sometimes I'm headed straight into the clinic, and sometimes I may be able to stay home and get the kids off. And getting the kids off means feeding them fat in the morning, mm -hmm. okay, fat and protein. So our kids are bacon eggs in the morning because I know that's gonna help their ability to concentrate at school. Yeah. And packing them their lunch so they don't have to eat the dietary guideline approved lunch at school. Yeah. Because I know what I put in their lunch is a lot better than what they're gonna get at school. Isn't it scary what kids eat at school? It is. Their it's options, so it's just frightening. Scary. and. And then your kid, their your kids. Like I have a little girl at home, and she's five in kindergarten, and she's so tempted by the school lunch and and the pop tarts and what other kids are bringing in, and we're our stuff. We try, so we really enhance the flavors and, and try and like use herbs and spices so it really tastes yummy, so that she doesn't want to eat that. But it's a, it's always a battle as a parent, right? It is always a battle. I mean, it's ridiculous. Like especially my big thing at school is the breakfast that they are serving kids. Mm -hmm. Like right. Like they have donut Wednesday and pop tart Thursday, right? And then oatmeal Friday and essentially, and then just with orange juice. So they're jacking kids up in the morning on just sugar, right? But it's still in the guidelines. It's still, you know, under the, the dietary guidelines approval. And then these kids are hyperactive in the morning. They're not able to concentrate. Just give Matterall, no big deal. <laughs> you know, yeah. it become, I mean, talk about a vicious cycle. It's yeah. starting when our kids enter kindergarten. Crazy. So it's a big problem. Yeah. We gotta change those guidelines. Totally, yeah. I mean, and think about the productivity and, and the trajectory of someone's life. Like if you don't do well in, in elementary, that can affect like advanced placement classes in high school, that it can affect college. So it's like, we really gotta start. And it like can affect saying. the fatty liver disease. Yeah. They're starting to develop that, right? I mean, it's, absolutely striking the amount of fatty liver disease diagnosed in kids as young as two. So yeah. our choices there are affecting them cognitively, definitely, and mm -hmm. their ability to perform, but their health is taking a hit. It's such a heartbreakingly early age. And it, there must be some epigenetic or programming, like a, a child who's overweight at like at age five or six or whatever, the probability of them being overweight as an adult, isn't it like much, it's much higher? It's astronomically high. high. Yes. You really got to start mm -hmm. there. It, you really do. You got to start it with kids and feeding them well from the get go. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I mean, there's some theories right now that really 
we set the stage for our kids and insulin resistance early on. The more sugar and refined carbohydrates those kids get, the more hypertrophied their um, uh, cells in their pancreas that make insulin, the beta cells that make mm -hmm. insulin get, and the more exaggerated insulin response they'll have to anything as they get older. Hmm. So, I mean, a lot of concerns. We, again, going back to the guidelines, I, I know I sound like a broken record, but if we can really help change our food culture mm -hmm. and change what kids are fed at school, we can really improve their health in the here and now, but their trajectory on everything going forth. Yeah, that's key. Uh, what's your favorite low carb, high fat food? If you can just pick one. My favorite low carb, high fat food is probably honestly pizza. Mm -hmm. I and and that's a guaranteed hit with kids. Yeah. Like at my kids' birthday parties and things like that, that's what we serve. We don't mm -hmm. serve the order pizza. We serve the low carb, high fat. You like know, cauliflower. Cheese. Yeah. No, I like the cheese almond flour oh, cool. uh, crust, mm -hmm. and they love it. It's yeah. kind of like they think of it as a stuffed crust pizza, mm -hmm. right? But it's like no, it's just cheese throughout. And, yeah. You know, it's that fat that the kids sometimes are missing because mm -hmm. they've been fed all this low fat, sugar laden things. Totally. So. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Love that. So if you were to bump shoulders with a politician, which I'm sure you have, in an elevator and they turned to you and said, Dr. Sarah, what's like the biggest, how can we move the needle the most in terms of a population level, uh, improving the health with nutrition or, or lifestyle? Uh, in 30 seconds, what would, you, what would you tell them? Dietary guidelines have to be reformed. Mm -hmm. The dietary guidelines are impacting essentially everyone. So we know that they impact the a, a huge part of the population on a daily basis, but they're also influencing things like the American Diabetes Association guidelines, like the American Heart Association guidelines. So we have to work on reform without question. And I would push them, and I push everybody, tell your representatives that this is something that's important for the health of our country. And quite frankly, what really impacts someone, like if I were in an elevator with a congressional, even a congressional aide, I'd say, we can't afford this anymore. Yeah, We're going broke mm -hmm. and that matters. Yeah, awesome. Thanks so much for coming oh, on. Oh, really thank appreciate you so much work. for having me. Been a huge fan. And we have just seconds here on the, on the uh, hard drive guys watching this. So if folks want to connect with you, is Twitter the best way? Twitter or me. yes, they can find me also at uh, vertahealth.com. Cool. Mm -hmm. And I'll put that in the show notes and all the studies that we mentioned that you published or co-authored, I'll put in the YouTube description below. So if you guys like this video, please hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, go follow Dr. Sarah Hallberg over on Twitter and at Verta Health. All right. All right. Thank you Thank so you. much.